Hello friends, I'm Rosa, welcome to the channel. So, I don't know how I've ended up in this spot once again, but I have a book haul for you. I got about 20 books that I've gathered recently, received recently, that I want to show you. Some of them are standard editions, some of them are special editions. They will primarily be from Fairy Loot, Illumicrate, and Owlcrate, so if you want to check out any of them, I will leave links to them in the description box, both their web pages, but also their Instagrams if you're curious. And every other book that I'm talking about will also be linked in the description box. I really don't know how I've managed to get another another haul for a video, like enough books to show off. I don't know. It feels like I did my last book haul two weeks ago. Here we are again though. So enough chatter. If you want to check out a specific genre, I always leave chapters in the or time chapters, timestamps slash chapters, so you can click on the timeline. We're gonna get started with young adult fantasy though, so um, yeah, let's get to it. First off, we're talking about a sequel I squealed when this arrived. It's The Dragon's Promise by Elizabeth Lim. It's the sequel to Six Crimson Cranes, which came out last year and I loved it. It was so cute. I have not read this one yet. Hoping to before the year is over, but I don't know. We'll see. I got many other books that I need to read. So anyway, in Six Crimson Cranes, we follow Shiori, who is a princess in a kingdom where magic is forbidden, but Shiori actually has magic, she just keeps it a secret. Shiori also has a stepmother and six brothers. She loves her brothers very, very much. Something happens one day, she ends up cursed. Her brothers end up being cursed to be cranes, and Shiori is basically told that whenever she utters a word, one of her brothers will die. So she can't even say or write her name either. She is literally banished from her home and unable to talk because it will kill her, her brothers, her very beloved brothers. So Shiori is left on her own in this big kingdom with her secret identity as well. And there's also something with a dragon, but I don't really know how to fit him into the synopsis, but there's a dragon. I'm guessing this book is mainly about him. So with the help of her paper bird, the dragon, and also her betrothed, is that the word? Shiori has to find her way back home and also somehow get rid of this curse as well. And that is Six Crimson Cranes. I don't know what this one is about yet, but like I said, I kind of think that it has more to do with the dragons in the story. So we will see. I have the first one. I read that in the US edition, but but I just love the UK editions so, so much. So I ended up purchasing the first one as the UK edition and then pre-ordered this one. I mean, look at it. It's like pastel heaven, right? It's pastel goodness. It's so cute. So that's what the story is. Well, very, very cute. So that is the first one. One down, 19 to go. Next up, we have a an Owl Crate special edition, and it is another sequel, actually, The Ballad of Never After, which is the sequel to, wow, that Once Upon a Broken Heart, that completely escaped me for a second. <laughs> Once Upon a Broken Heart by Stephanie Garber. If you want to know what's special about this book, we got end papers that look like this. We have foiling on the naked cover that looks like this. It's purple. And we also have some inside dust jacket by Gemlin on Instagram. Can't say much of what this book is about, but as for the first one, oh, I gotta watch out because this dims the lighting on my camera. Wow. She's very shiny. As for the first one, though, we follow Evangeline Fox, who is desperately in love with a guy whose name I forgot, but <laughs> there's a guy. She's desperately in love with him and has been in love with him for, like, ages. Unfortunately, he's getting married to her sister. So Evangeline, being desperate, decides to contact one of the fates. So the fates are basically, like, gods in this world. They each have their own ability. They're each each cursed in a different way. And Evangeline decides to contact Jax, who is Prince of Hearts. Is that what they call Jack of Hearts? Jax, not not Jack. Jax. I forgot exactly what his title is, but it's something like that. <laughs> Jax is basically cursed to kill everyone he kisses, except from his true love, but he's uh, he's not found his true love yet. So, you know, or has he? Hmm, has he? I, anyway. <laughs> 
We're entering spoiler territory, so I'm just not gonna... That was not a spoiler, don't worry, but we're entering spoilery territory, so I'm just gonna watch out a little bit. But he's, uh, that's basically his, like, ability, his curse. He kills everyone he kisses. Yes. And he eats a lot of apples. And uh, he's also not very trustworthy, so Evangeline might not have contacted the right person for the job, but she's stuck with him now. And that's what the first one is about, although also a lot more. Like, they go to a ball and everything. Like, there's a, there's a lot more. Evangeline has, like, a sip sitting, a hidden past as well, a secret past. So she also has pink hair or, like, rose gold hair. I don't know, an important thing to note. It's, like, very whimsical fairy tale-like. It is also very much related to the Caravel trilogy, also by Stephanie Garber. So if you read those, why haven't you read Once Upon a Broken Heart? <laughs> if you haven't read Once Upon a Broken Heart, I recommend that you read Caravel, the trilogy, before. Just because timeline-wise, they take place before this series. So, but yeah, it's a trilogy. This is the sequel. Third one will be out probably next year. We will see. Then we have another sequel, <laughs> and one that I'm super excited for. It is Defy... Th Ugh, why do I never <laughs> defend the dawn by Bridget Kemmerer? I keep messing up the title of this book and I don't know why, but like that's a thing. Why is it a thing? Stop. Okay, Defend the Dawn by Bridget Kimmerer. Sequel to Defy the Night, also by Bridget Kimmerer. I think it's only a duology, so I think this is the last book. I loved Defy the Night, like I loved it. I loved it so much, I thought it was almost perfect YA fantasy. So I'm so excited to read this, but in Defy the n Night. Oh, I got sidetracked. <laughs> or not sidetracked. I was thrown off my game because suddenly it said Defy the Night on the back. And I was like, no, is that the title of this one? I don't know what it is with these two. I can't do the titles. In Defy the Night, though, we follow... It's a Robin Hood retelling, so we follow two people. They are rebels. I think her name is Tess. Her name is Tessa, the lead girl that we follow. But they are rebels in this kingdom that is basically not overrun, but there's like a plague doing its rounds, a sickness that can only be cured or at least held at bay by this very specific flower. Unfortunately, the rich people are hoarding this flower because they're using way too much of it, much more than is necessary. So Tessa and another person has taken it upon themselves to steal some of this flower and actually distribute it to some of the poorer people in this city. So that's what they do. Unfortunately, one day something goes very wrong and Tessa finds herself in a little bit of a bad spot and decides to start to infil- or not start, she decides to infiltrate the castle where the royals live. Somehow manages and whatever she finds inside the castle, whatever information she falls upon, shocks her to her core. And she also starts to question that maybe this kingdom can't actually be saved. So that's mainly what the- what, what this book is about, or the first one. I don't know about this one. I'm guessing we go to see, but I'm not really sure. I need to like brush up my memory of the first one, exactly what happened in the ending before I go into this one. I'm so excited though. Might cover it in a spoiler vlog over on Patreon because we read the last, not the last one, we read the first one together last year. So that might happen. If you're interested, there's a link to my book club in the pinned comment, but we'll see. I hope to get around to it before the year is over. So I'm really excited for it. Anyway, next book we have a fairy loot special edition. I actually have- this is the whole story. Okay, it's Belladonna by Adeline Grace. The thing is, <laughs> this edition is damaged and then they sent me a replacement for this one, but the replacement also showed up and was damaged. So now they're sending me a replacement for the replacement, meaning I am sitting on three copies of fairy loot's Belladonna all of a sudden and I think it's so funny. <laughs> As long as they replace it because it's damaged, I'm okay with it, like it doesn't bother me. But I think it's really funny. So anyway, this book, like I mentioned, is from Fairy Loot. It has black background instead of this like dusty rose pink that the original is. It also has stenciled edges that look like this. They are very pretty. It also comes with beautiful end papers that look like this in the front and then in the back they look like this and they are done by monolime art who is one of my favorite like artists who do bookish art and there's also art printed directly onto the naked cover that looks like this also the texture of the book is really nice like i don't know exactly how to explain it but it's really nice <laughs> it feels nice i just want to say that i'm obsessed with this picture by the way the vibe in this is so good so i don't know much about what this book is about 
about other than we follow a 19 year old girl who has been orphaned as a child and has kind of been moving from foster family to foster family. Each family has not treated her well and they basically also ended up, I think, dying. <laughs> I don't know why I laughed at that. Anyway, I think they have all died. So 19 year old Signa though still has some remaining relatives, although they have some issues like the daughter is suffering from a mysterious illness for example and there's some other mysterious things going on with this family too as far as I've gathered and then one day Signa is actually contacted by her dead mother who claims that she has been poisoned like that's why she died she was poisoned and that the remaining relatives of Signa might actually be in danger so she both teams up with a stable boy but she also, more importantly, or at least more helpful to her, I'm not really sure how to put this, she also teams up with Death, who she might have a bit of a connection with. And I think there might be a love story between her and Death as well, but I've never read the book, so we'll see. I'm very confused though. I'm very interested. I think we're gonna read this together in the book club as the secondary pick in November, so I'll know a little bit more when November is uh, is over. And as far as I know, this is actually also upper YA, so it might be a little bit less clean. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to phrase it, but maybe you get what I mean. I didn't mean to rhyme there, that just happened. But moving on. I literally just opened the next book and there's a I don't, this is where I belong. It's bought used by the way, <laughs> so like this is not mine. <laughs> I've not opened it before now. That's funny. You always find funny stuff in, in used books. Very interesting. But the next book is called Down the Hawk by Magistief Vader. This is the first one in the Dreamer trilogy. I think the third one is actually out this month or November. I, I don't remember. But in this book, we follow three different people. They are, one is a dreamer. And a dreamer is quite hard to explain when you've not read the book, but they dream a lot and can kind of like, as far as I've understood, pull things out from their dreams into at least their own reality. Not sure how that works. This whole dreaming ability is something that is very sought after. There are people who will try to catch or capture these dreamers so they can use them, but also kill them before anything goes bad with this whole dreaming thing. <laughs> we also follow a girl who is a thief and is after an object that I believe is in a dream. I'm not really sure how that works either, but anyway. And then there is a third girl or a third person. One of them is actually, three people total. One of them is actually a boy, but the third person is a girl and she's what they call a hunter. She had a brother once who used to be a dreamer and he used to also kill people. So how he did that, I'm expecting that has something to do with his dreaming ability. She might have seen it, she'd come a hunter after it because she knows that this dreaming thing is a dangerous ability to have. And other than that, I think the world might be in danger. I'm guessing that's what that <laughs> that's what's gonna happen, but we will see. I've heard lovely things about this trilogy, which is why I decided to get the first one. Also, now that it's a finished trilogy, it's a little bit easier to take the plunge. So I decided to get the first one when I saw that it was uh, abused because I don't have easy access to used books. So when I see them for a low price, I jump on it. That's just how it works, I jump on it. I don't think, I just go. Okay, so next up we have a uh, collector's edition of a book that I actually already own and it's The Savage Song by V.E. Schwab. So it's a collector's edition. It has a redesigned cover that looks like this. It's a little bit shiny in parts. It also has these cool, cool edges, which I know has something to do with the story. I think one of the people, I've not read it, but I think one of the, uh, one of the characters, I think it's him actually, the one who plays the music, has like, for, for every, I'm expecting it's for people killed, but maybe that's just, just because I have a morbid way of thinking, <laughs> but he has like, these scratched onto his arms, so as far as I remember at least. And it also has some black foiling on the naked cover and in papers that look like this. Not red, so it's a little bit hard to open, but it's very cool. So what I know about the Savage Song, the duology is that monsters roam free now in the world. They roam free. We follow two characters that are from opposing families in the city. Opposing in the way that both these families are basically wanting to control the city. Yeah. 
So like they're both heirs to the power that this family holds and the families are opposing. You got the point. I don't know why I'm explaining, why I'm explaining it so much, but anyway. <laughs> One day something happens though, there is an assassination attempt and the two people, the two lead characters find themselves having to work together in this very dangerous world. There's also something about music and I think it's used as a weapon in this book. However, I can't really explain it without having read it. So we're gonna wait a little bit with that one, but I know that music does play a big part in this book as well, which is also why it's the Savage song. Yes. I just really, I saw this edition and I love V.E. Schwab, so I, I jumped on it. The edges are so cool, okay? I have no willpower. Then I have another Owl Crate edition. This one is The Drowned Woods by Emily Lloyd Jones. So in this book, we follow What's her? Mare. I just remembered as I said that. We follow Mare, who is the world's last water diviner. So she has the ability to shape and control water. It's an ability that's very sought after. She has also in the past been captured and actually used by the prince to kill people with this ability. As we start the book though, she's living in peace, just living life as she wants to. However, one day her old handler, who also used to work for the prince, finds her and makes a proposition. He wants her help to kill kill the prince. The prince is like evil. Majorly evil, by the way. So Mare, the handler, and a group of other people, including a corgi, who may or may not be a spy, group up and there's something about a heist as well. Actually, I'm not sure she's supposed to kill the prince, but she might be supposed to kill the prince. I guess we'll see. But there's a heist as well and a corgi who may or may not be a spy. There's a corgi in it. I'm excited to read this. <laughs> but this is an Alcrate exclusive. So cover is usually black or no, it's it's dark blue. This edition is white. It fits with their The Bone Houses edition as well. It has foiling on the front that looks like this and also foiling on the back that looks like this, like an icon or a symbol of some kind. It also has some end papers of Mare controlling water. And it also comes with inside dust jacket art of our group running from or running with water horses. I'm not really sure. Maybe Mare made those horses, conjured those horses. I'm not sure. Unless they're Kelpies. What are they running from? Guess I'll need to read this book to figure that out. Okay, so that's another one. I'm super excited to read this eventually. I don't know what I'm going to though. And another Owl Crate edition. This one is The Depths by Nicole Lesperenze. I don't know how to pronounce her last name. I apologize. It has a redesigned cover. It usually has like a cover of a girl surrounded by flowers, very tropical plants and flowers. And she looks very scared. I'm very happy that it's a redesigned cover though because if there's a spider on the original one and I don't like spiders. If there's one thing you need to know about me, I do not do well with spiders. So this has, whoa, almost dropped it. It has art printed onto the naked cover, which is so nice. Like the color on this is so, it's so good. Also has foily end papers that look like this. And there is also art on the inside of the dust jacket that looks like this. So in the depths we follow Addie, who is on, she's basically been forced to tag along on her mother's honeymoon to this very tropical island. As she shows up there, she's first bored, but then she meets a young guy and things start to change once she meets him. He tells her that the island loves her. However, Addie is experiencing weird things such as she cannot stop sleepwalking. The birds won't stop calling her name and there's also a girl in the woods who wants to play hide and seek with her. So very, very strange things. And then Addie starts to unravel some of the secrets of the island, such as there was actually two girls centuries ago who ended up dying on the island. So the island might be hiding some secrets. And if Addie doesn't start to be careful, she might actually never be able to leave. So this is a horror as well. I should probably say the rest is very much YA fantasy, but this is, uh, this is YA fantasy and horror on a tropical island. Very exciting. So those are my YA books. Why did I not put that on the horror? I'm not actually sure. Could have put it on the horror. Anyway, but those are my YA books for this round. Eight down, 12 to go. <laughs> So I'm gonna remove these and we're gonna move on to adult fantasy. So we're gonna start out with one that I'm actually currently reading, although reading it very, very slowly. 
I may have started three other books at the same time. So it's my own fault <laughs> that this is going very slowly. And I have two versions of it. I got the standard UK version of or edition of Babel by R.F. Kuang, but I also have, and this is gonna be a little bit difficult to show, this is the Illuminate special edition. So I'm just gonna put this down for a second. It comes in a slip case. I might have turned it upside down on purpose, but it comes in a slip case. The slip case is very much inspired by the trade edition. It has this on the spine. And as for the book itself, it has the map of Babel on the book on the naked cover. And it also has edges that look like this, an act of translation. Yes. An act of translation is always an act of betrayal. I'm pretty sure the camera just focused on my face, but we're gonna go with it anyway. And it has end papers that look like this. Plus, there should also be... Yes, there's a letter by R. Kuang in the book, which is pretty cool. It looks like it looks like an actual letter. It's very, very cool. So I'm gonna put this over here because I don't really want to touch it too much. <laughs> I break things and I don't want to break it. But as for Babel, adult fantasy, historical fiction, historical fantasy, we follow Robin, who is half Chinese. He was picked up from China after his mother died and brought to the UK to work at Babel or like study but also work at Babel. Babel is the center for translation and is basically one of the reasons that the UK holds so much power. The UK in this book is very, I mean, I would say it's rooted in reality. <laughs> without offending anyone. But we know history, okay? We know history. The UK is, especially England, is very power hungry. <laughs> so this takes place in the 1850s? 30s? Hold on. 1830s. So around that time, the UK had a lot of c colonize, colonize? Col colon, oh, I completely forgotten the word. Colonies. Oh, geez. Okay. A lot of colonies and stuff. So like, you know, that sort of Okay, but Robin finds himself at Babel, where they do a lot of translations, but also they do silver working. Silver working, silver has like a, it's hard to explain also without actually fully having it had explained to me in the book as of right now, but it holds magical powers somehow. Best if I don't try to explain it. And Robin has not been treated well, might I just add, after coming to the UK, because people are racist. <laughs> she says laughing, it's not funny. People are straight up racist, so he's not been treated very well as a half Chinese man. So of course he starts to question certain things with this whole establishment and also with the UK being in power through all this like bad deeds, if you will, bad actions and stuff. And that's all I know so far, but I'm gonna guess something has to give at a certain point. You know, there has to be some kind of drama at a certain point. So far, it's very interesting to read though, especially if you like languages and you find that interesting. As someone who's had four languages in school, you could say that I'm interested. <laughs> but it's also a very straight on, like a very honest book when it touches on certain subjects such as racism but also colonization of various areas and also people talking about slavery and stuff. It's very honest, very... I don't want to call it non-polished. What is the right word for it? Not sugar-coated. Yeah, so something to take into consideration, but it's very interesting. Just going through it very slowly. <laughs> There's a lot of footnotes in the book as well. That'll give you information of various things and it's very fun to read. Next up, we have a fantasy romance and that is The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy by Megan Bannon. So this is hard to explain, but we are following two very different people. One is a caretaker, a marshal. Why did I think he was a caretaker? Oh, because she's an undertaker. <laughs> He's a marshal, so he patrols the wilds of this world area that they live in. I'm not really fully sure. She's an undertaker, which I'm gonna be straight up honest, I don't really know what is, but I'm something's telling me that it has to do with dead bodies and I don't know, I'm guessing this will have to explain it to me when I start to read it, but the two don't get along at all. They do have run-ins with each other, but they don't get along at all. However, after a particularly bad run-in with Mercy, Hart finds himself writing and sending a letter to a friend, an anonymous friend. He doesn't know who it is. I think we know where this is going though. I think we know who it is. <laughs> 
that person might be Mercy, so the two are kind of like, in real life, enemies face to face, but without knowing it, are actually really good pen pals. And that's where I'm gonna leave that, because other than that, I'm really confused, but I've heard Fun things about this. I didn't know that the book existed until Fairylou did it for August, I think it was. And then I started to look into it and I thought it was fun because it's like a fantasy romance. I don't know, a romance, a rom-com, but with fantasy vibes as well. I think I'm gonna love it. So she's she's here, she's looking cute. Then we have an Illumicrate special edition. Another one. It is The Oleander Sword by Tasha Suri, which is the sequel to the Jasmine Throne. I almost want to call it The Burning Kingdom, but that's what the series is called. This is the sequel. There is also going to be a third one, as far as I remember. I loved the first one. I read it over the summer, so... I was really excited when I saw that Illumicrate was doing a special edition of it. Now it fits with my other special edition, because I do have their first one. But as for this copy, we have stenciled edges that look like this, also on the bottom and on the top as well. And there's a little bit of foiling as well on the naked cover, which looks like this. It's very simple. It fits with the first one. As for the Jasmine Throne, we follow a prince. No, we follow a princess, not a prince. We follow a princess who has been exiled to a temple. I'm going to call it a temple because I don't remember exactly what the right word for is, for it is, but a temple. Her brother basically wants to burn her, but she has to give herself willingly, and she doesn't want to get burned, go figure. So instead, she's been exiled to this temple. The temple is run by priestesses, and one of these priestesses might have some secrets of her own. Something happens one day with the priestess that our princess oversees, or she notices, she, she's not supposed to see, but she sees, she witnesses something happen, happening. And so she decides to ask for our priestess as her personal, like, her maid, her personal maid, because she wants to use our priestess and her abilities, her secret stuff, to escape this temple. So the two of them have to work together. The priestess also has some other secrets regarding her family that she's basically like, her top priority in life is to protect her family. And um, yes, it's a lovely book. It was beautiful. I thought it was well built up. The there's a romance in it. It's not like in your face romance. It's definitely not the main plot of it, but I really loved how it was just like slowly built up. So I'm really excited to see what happens in this one eventually. Because where we left it off as well, our princess was um she's turning into a little bit of a badass. I'm excited to I'm excited to see where she goes, you know, where she goes in life. Yes. Next up, we have a Greek mythology retelling. It's Electra by Jennifer Saint. I'm gonna be straight up honest and say that I don't fully know or understand what this book is about, other than we follow three women who may have played a part in, uh, in Greek mythology at some point, <laughs> and also have fates that are intertwined in one way or another. But their names are so long. We follow Clitemet no, Clytemnestra, who is the sister of Helen. So if you remember the battle of, what's it called? The battle of Troy? Troy, where they had the like long, long battle. Helen is the wife of Agamemnon, who was the leader of the army. Oh, but yeah, he's the, he's on the side of the Greek people. Why am I even, why am I here? Why am I doing this? <laughs> He was leading the Greeks in this Battle of Troy. Uh, the Battle of Troy basically started because Helen was taken by, and I'm pretty sure there were supposed to be lovers at the time, but Helen was taken by someone called Paris, who was not with the Greeks, and Agamemnon basically started this war to get Helen back. So I don't fully know how Clytemnestra comes into this other than she is Helen's sister, but that is the thing. We also follow Cassandra, who is the princess of Troy, and she is cursed to be able to see the future, but no one believes her when she tells people of the future that she's seen. And then we also follow Electra, who is the daughter of Clytemnestra and Agamemnon. So yes, Agamemnon was his wife, was unfaithful to his wife, despite starting this war to get... Men are stupid sometimes, okay? That was my point with that rant, but anyway. <laughs> and Electra, being the daughter, is horrified by all this bloodletting, all this war. So what the plot is, I have no idea other than we follow these three women, but 
I'm guessing if it's a little bit like what I've heard about Ariadne, it's supposed to be feminist as well, so we'll see about that. You know when you get a very floppy paperback and it's like the best thing ever? Ha! <laughs> I love when they do this without any, any resistance. So this is Gleam by Raven Kennedy. It's the third one in the Plate of Prisoner series, which I believe is five books total. I've not read the first two, but I needed to order something off Amazon, so I decided to get the third one. <laughs> I have a very good feeling that I'm gonna love this series, so I felt like it was okay, but can I tell you exactly what it's about? No. I think I also would prefer it if I didn't know too much about it going into it. What I do know is that it's a retelling of King Midas, or like the story of King Midas. We follow a woman who has been taken as a prisoner by King Midas, and he is basically the only person that she ever sees. So for years and years, he's been the only face. His face is the only face that she's seen. He's the only one she's had any contact with whatsoever. So there's a little bit of a Stockholm Syndrome case over this, or like a little bit of a Stockholm syndrome situation going on because she actually has ended up loving King, King Midas. But then a, a war breaks out and as a part of a an agreement between King Midas and this man, she's traded off as a prisoner, she's traded off to this guy and suddenly she doesn't have the one person that she's been in contact with for years and years. The one person that she's seen. She doesn't have him anymore. Other than that, I don't really know. <laughs> so, but I'm excited. We might do a read-along of it in November. I'm not fully sure how to do it yet, but I think we might do a read-along of it in November. So if you want to join, I will keep you guys posted about it over on the community tab, but it'll probably be through the book club, just just so, just so you know. And then the last adult fantasy book that we have to talk about is The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches. <laughs> I'm sorry why the title is so long. This is by Sangu Mandana. That is such a cute name. I don't know why, but it's just a really cute name. So this book is like, think the house in the cerulean sea, but with witches. Yes, we follow our lead girl, woman, who is who is a witch, but she's secretly a witch. She keeps it a secret. She has like a blog or like a channel, YouTube channel, something, where she does magic stuff, but nobody actually believes that it is magic that she does. At least as far as I've gathered, it doesn't actually say this in the synopsis, but I'm pretty sure that I read that somewhere. So she keeps it a secret anyway. One day though, she receives a message, a very mysterious message, that is like, come to this house. We have witches. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not what they said, but let's just go with it anyway. So she shows up at this house and at the house, there are children that are witches. It is run by other adult witches as well. There is also, I think he's a librarian who is a little bit off-putting to her, but he's like really good with the kids. So she's, you can't fully hate him, but she doesn't really get along with them. And our lead girl, despite having gone through her life, she's an orphan, so she's been brought up at an orphanage. She's used to being alone. She's content with being alone. But after being in this house for a while, she's kind of starting to reconsider this whole I'm fine alone business that she's doing. And then one day, danger might come knocking at the door. And our lead girl is forced to kind of decide is she gonna help the witches with this business or is she just gonna go her own way. So it does really remind me of the house in the Cerulean, the house in the Cerulean Sea, but I'm excited for this. We are going to be reading this in November with the book club. The cover is so cute. I just wanna, the cover is adorable. I, I just love these kind of covers, these cartoony kind of covers. So cute. So um, I feel like my synopsis of that was a little bit all over the place, but hopefully you understood it anyway. But yeah, those are my adult fantasy books. We got two horror books and then we have three rom-coms. Yes, three rom-coms. And then we're done with this book haul. So I'm gonna take these down and we're gonna continue with the horror books. So this is actually one that I'm reading here in October. It's Into the Drowning Deep by Mira Grant. In this book, we follow a crew who has been sent out to, I think it's an underwater situation. So like they have to go into the water because a year ago, or at least 
some time in the past, a film crew that was doing a mockumentary, doing some research and, you know, some stuff, went into the water around this area and they were never seen again. So the crew in this book is sent off to figure out what happened to this crew. And there might be some dangerous creature lurking about in the waters. I'm pretty sure I know what this is about. I'm pretty sure that based on the cover, it's about mermaids but killer mermaids so i'm excited to read this also because i feel like if something is really gonna scare me it's gonna have to be under or in water i hate open water i don't want to read about spiders i'm not doing it i can read about open water like it's not a phobia where a spiders is is a phobia but open water just scares me you know like it, there's so much water on this planet there's so much water on this planet it's terrifying. So I think if something's gonna scare me, it's going to be that. And I hope it'll do its job. We'll see though. The other horror book that I have to talk about is Nettle and Bone by T. Kingfisher that I'm actually also reading this month. And in this one, we follow our lead girl who is the third born daughter. So her two sisters have been taken captive by the prince who is basically more or less torturing them. Can I say that on YouTube? Let's go with it anyway. And our lead girl has kind of been forced to sit back and watch this happening because she can't really do much. Like, she is the last person who is able to do something about this. No one else cares. Just her. So, she decides to one day finally do something about it, or at least try. So she seeks out a grave witch who will give her some tools to help with this situation with her sisters if our lead girl completes three completely impossible tasks. But this is a fairy tale after all, dark fairy tale, and impossible tasks may not be fully impossible after all. So our lead girl ends up teaming up with the Grave Witch. There's also, what are the others? A reluctant fairy godmother, a strapping former knight, and also a chicken possessed by a demon. I have questions about that last one, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> And the five of them end up fighting the prince together. So I think I just realized that the four icons on, or the five icons on the cover actually symbolize the people that are helping her. So the chicken, the fairy godmother, the knight, and the grave witch. But I never noticed until now. Okay, well, that's our second Torah book. So now we got three rom-coms. <laughs> And um, three very hyped rom-coms, might I just add. The first one, or the first two, are The Love Hypothesis and also Love on the Brain, both by Allie Hazelwood. These are the Illumicrate editions. So they have alternative colorways. Um, this usually is blue. I actually have the... Where is it? Oh, there it is. Well, I'm blind. I have the original cover right here. So it's usually blue. It has mint spread edges and it also has some foiling on the, uh, the naked cover which is super cute. Love on the Brain is usually pink and I was, I love the original colorway so I was very nervous if they were gonna make it like green or something but I love that they stuck to purple and then pink sprayed edges but also foiling on the naked cover that looks like this so the two editions go together very perfectly but these are two standalones they are not in a series but they do kind of have similar vibes to them in this one the love hypothesis we follow our lead girl olive who is very focused on her job not job she's becoming a scientist she's very focused on her degree she has a friend who desperately wants olive to date someone. She doesn't want Olive to end up lonely, too focused on her job, and is also a little bit worried that Olive is sad because her friend is also starting to like someone that Olive might have dated a little bit, not fully, but just like a little bit. Olive doesn't care, but her friend is convinced that she's sad about it. So Olive tells her friend that she's on a date one night, but she's actually at school, just, you know, doing research and stuff. Unfortunately for Olive, her friend is actually at the school too, and because she doesn't want to end up making her friend sad because she's lied to her, she decides to kiss the first guy that she sees at the school. And that happens to be this dude, whose name is Adam. So Adam is a professor at the school. I'm, I'm not really sure why that's ethically okay, but it is in this book. <laughs> and the two of them end up basically, it was actually Adam's idea, which is sort of funny, but they end up fake dating to keep up this facade of Olive actually 
actually dating Adam to avoid making her friends sad. <laughs> so that's a whole thing. And that's where I'm gonna leave that. I've read this book already. I loved it. I thought it was hilarious. I think it's a very self-aware rom-com. So I was really happy that Illumicrate was offering reprints of the first one to go with love on the brain. I mean, can we kind of agree that the two guys sort of in the same, like they have the same kind of vibe to them? I don't know. So in this one, we follow B. Is her name B? Her name is B, and she might possibly work at NASA. I think she might possibly work at NASA. And she also has to work alongside this guy who's basically her arch nemesis from school. The two of them don't like each other. They've never gotten along. Some things happen at this study they're doing or at the work. Some of her stuff goes missing. Lee, his name is, starts to be a little bit more helpful with B. And B is starting to question why Lee is suddenly treating her so well, being nice to her, bagging her plays and taking her side and stuff like that. And um, that's all I know. I think that's all I know. Oh, why did I put them over there? I wasn't supposed to. But like... Reluctant allies, enemies to love, or at least rivals to lovers. If it's written anything like the love hypothesis, I'm going to love it. So I'm excited, but I've not read it yet. It's been out for a while. That's usually how it goes with my books. I have them because I pre-ordered them and then I just don't read them. I don't, it's fine. And then the last one is The American Roommate Experiment by Elena Armas, who wrote The Spanish Love Dissect. Deception. Deception. In this one, though, we follow Rosie, who you may know from the Spanish Love Deception. And she has quit her job to work on her secret, very passionate dream, which is becoming a, or at least she's a romance writer. I'm not actually sure if she's actually a romance writer going into this or if it's like a secret, but she wants to at least be a romance writer. Unfortunately, as she's quit her job, she hits a bit of a creative slump and then the ceiling in her apartment ends up falling down as well or breaking down. I'm not, how do you, wait, how do you, falls in? Okay, it falls in. I wasn't sure how to phrase that, but anyway. So she ends up having to move in with her friend, but her friend has already lent out her room to her cousin, who Rosie has maybe or may not stalked a little bit on Instagram. Is kind of obsessed with him. It's a thing. He is not the best of roommate when it comes to boundaries as like he'll walk around in a towel. I don't know about you guys, but when I used to have roommates, we'd not do that. We, no, don't do that. But he'll also be nice. Like he smiles at her, he cracks jokes. He has a little bit of an irresistible accent as well and he cooks for her. And then he learns about her creative slump and decides to take her on a series of dates so that she can get a little bit of her creative spark back. And that's what this book is about. I have heard that this is not nearly as good as The Spanish Love Deception, but I'm gonna go into it with an open mind. Ooh, don't fall down. I don't want other people's opinions to color mine before I go into it. So I'm just gonna disregard everything that everyone else said. I love the Spanish love deception so I'm really hoping that I'll get along with this book as well but we will see. But that is my last or those are my last five books so the book haul is over. I've been sat here for a little bit. I hope you enjoyed it. Like I mentioned you can find links to all of the books in the description box to both Book Depository but also you as Amazon if you want to check them out. I'll read the synopses and just see a little bit more about them you can find the links in the description box if you read any of them let me know though in the comments and if you want to check out the book club and support the channel a little bit more you can do that by clicking on the link in the pinned comment but that is all i got for you guys today so i hope you all enjoyed this book haul i promise there will only be one more this year just one <laughs> i'm gonna restrain myself no more buying books okay so um we'll see about that in november december Yes. Hope you all enjoyed this one though. If you did, feel free to hit the thumbs up. And if you want to see more videos like this from me, but also videos such as bookish unboxings and wrap up videos, TBR videos, and you know, all that other booktube stuff, definitely consider hitting the subscribe button. Well, that's all I got for you guys today. So I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you all in the next video. Bye bye. Oh, you know, you know you're